Good afternoon to all participants and welcome to our webinar on Insights from Data, supporting local transport restart plans, organised by Land or Links and part of the Green Transport Recovery webinar series. My name is Jonathan Raper, I'm CEO of TransportAPI.com, the UK's leading platform on managed services in public transport. We provide data to around 25% of UK bus and rail apps across modes and sectors, including organisations like Transport for West Midlands, National Express, First Group, Heathrow and others. And so we see the levels of usage of public transport and the journeys that people are planning on our platform. For example, we deliver the bus tracking and occupancy data for the first bus app nationally. And we were very proud to see a recent motion of the Scottish Parliament praising the development uh, for helping passengers in COVID times. Now, I live in London, um, but I'm buying a house in Hampshire. I have parents in Sussex and I had a staycation in Norfolk. So I've been seeing a variety of local responses to um, coronavirus restart plans around the country. I cycle on all my short journeys, uh, but I've also been using public transport and I own a car. So I've been seeing a lot of the different responses through the eyes of different users day by day. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from our webinar presenters about best practice in the use of data to guide the implementation of local uh, restart planning around the country. So this afternoon's 90 minute webinar uh, will consist of presentations by James Hill, Business Development Director of Vivacity Labs, David Atkin, uh, an analyst for Transport for Greater Manchester, Llewellyn Morgan, Head of Innovation for Oxfordshire County Council, and Giles Lipscomb, Consultant in Data Analytics, Modeling and Visualization for ITP, followed by a Q&A session. So we'll hear from each presenter for seven to eight minutes uh, and then we will um, spend time at the end um, in a discussion and ans asking questions. I will pop up uh, from time to time to introduce speakers and keep everyone to time. As you listen, please think of the questions you'd like to ask and enter them in the question box on your GoToMeeting control panel. I'll go through as many questions as possible after the presentations. Don't forget to give your name and role along with a question so I can present it appropriately to the panel. Okay, it's time to get started. I would now like to introduce James Hill, who is Business Development Director at Vivacity Labs. Can we have James' slides, please? Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, hopefully get this camera started, it's always the same way. <coughs> there we go. Okay, so I'm James Hill uh, from Vivacity Labs. Um, we uh, effectively provide uh, sensors which utilize uh, video analytics and uh, machine learning to basically identify anything that moves within a certain road space. So if we could come on to the next slide. Um, as you can see from this one, on the picture on the left-hand side, you'll see what the sensor actually looks like. Uh, it's not as big as it, I know it looks a bit Darth Vader-y, uh, but it's not very big, it's about the size of an A4 piece of paper. Um, and you'll see from the picture what it pretty much looks at. It's it's almost like a, a fake human eye and it picks up everything and it looks at it, puts it in a box, identifies it and then works out what it is from there. So out of that, it can basically work out that if it's a, a cyclist, a pedestrian, um, and you'll see at the bottom along this slide uh, the various different categories that we do. It's nine. So we <clears throat> try and categorize every, as many different things as we can. Um, the joys of it being the fact that it is machine learning is the fact that we can teach the system to learn new shapes um, uh, very easily. Uh, E-scooters being one of the big main ones at the moment that is coming out. Uh, we're training the system to recognize those. Uh, so obviously we can classify those and count them. Um, and then produce uh, the data from there. Um, the data we, we do produce uh, is where we saw uh, a gap in the marketplace and the fact that it's uh, councils very typically don't get hyper accurate granular data. So that's where we feel in uh, with a simple sensor that sits on um, street, regular street furniture um, and can attach to buildings as well. Can I have the next slide, please? So where we fit in in the active travel world? Well, obviously the world has changed uh, dramatically over the last six months. Um, and so we need to understand what it is that's going to create modal shift and what is it actually going to get people onto uh, getting out and utilizing active travel. So 
even though the system can identify cyclists, we can also identify uh, the volumes of cyclists. We need councils need to understand how cyclists uh, are utilising a road space. So with this, we can through the entire field of view of the sensor show where they go um, not just as a box on a or, or, or on the sensor itself but also we can produce path data within that as well so we can see interactions so particularly as uh, temporary uh, installations are being uh, put in place that the we can show how uh, cyclists interacts with pedestrians and other vehicle uh, other vehicles within a certain area Obviously, a lot of the time, cycle lanes um, aren't bollarded off or aren't curtailed off. So we sometimes councils will need to see how that interaction is. And again, what we found out with monitoring a lot of cycling uh, around uh, the country in uh, Manchester and uh, TfL and uh, various other places, the fact that a lot of the times, even though there are cycleways there, there are cyclists who are not using those and preferring to go on the road space. So it gives the council a better understanding of why they're doing that. So, and out of that, um, what the councils can then see is the fact that they have in real time uh, access to all this data, both from a portal and also through an API, which can be fed into various other platforms that they can look at. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So, um, what it is that how are we going to get people to change the way they work? Well, a lot of the time it's safety that comes up as a, an apparent situation whereby people aren't sure whether cycling and or walking in certain parts is going to be safe. So what we try to do is we try to show uh, and give uh, councils and uh, local authorities effectively an overview of exactly what's happening in that in in that uh, in that road space, so that it enables them to look at and go. Does an intervention need to be changed there? Does it need to be uh, moved for a certain area just so it create, increases the, the safety, but also it helps um, the uh, pedestrians or cyclists uh, utilize it better? So it's all about getting a little bit better understanding of what's going on in a road space that is already squeezed. Um, and obviously a lot of the new active travel um, installations are already squeezing a road network that's under pressure in a lot of our cities so it's very important to understand how that how that works um, not just what's going on right now but they need to plan for the future and how they're going to keep that and keep that in place and, and maximize what they can out of their network so as you'll see through this um, it's getting a good understanding of how that how it worked before the scheme Obviously, with COVID, it's slightly difficult, but it's going to work out through and after the scheme. Could I have the next slide, please? Again, so this moves on to, how, again, how that impacts the road space. So you can see uh, a particular good version of this is on the, the second uh, photo at the bottom um, in the fact that you can see that there is obviously quite a, there is, the, the installation of cones has been put in there, but it's not exactly a huge safety feature, but you do have cyclists on one side and traffic on the other side. So again, it's about understanding that reallocation of road space, and it gives the council a complete overview in terms of the path data, again, with interactions, but also the number of people doing it. Um, a lot of the time, councils come to us and say, well, actually, we've got a very good idea to put in uh, an intervention here. We think it's a good idea, but we don't actually know. We don't have the data to be able to show that it is the right thing to do, or do we put it you know, half a mile down the road, or do we not put it in there at all? So it's all about giving the information across so that the right decisions can be made for the right if for the right place. So could I have the next slide, please? So also out of that as well, um, we are being able to with our path data. See, you'll see on the the bottom left hand. Um, photo there that we are now able to, because of the past data we collect, we're able to do social distancing data as well. So again, we can prove to not just pedestrians, but we can see again the interactions between pedestrians and cyclists and other, and other road users. So again, it's about creating and helping to give as much information across to our clients as possible. And again, creating hotspots where there are issues. Um, so again, it's about utilising the assets that uh, local authorities have better because it, with typically the way that they do it, it's very much a spot check 
um, and what we're trying to give them is a complete full picture of what is going on 24-7, 365. Could I have my next slide, please? And just to give you an idea of what actually comes out of the back end, really, um, it's a very good answer. This was just a quick graph of uh, our cities last week. Um, as you'll see, uh, the the uptake in active travel was about the same before uh, lockdown. It's gone back up to where it was um, around lockdown. Uh, you'll see the red line there has dipped, um, which is commercial traffic. And that's obviously because of Bank Holiday Monday. So but what it, this shows is that hyper-accurate data, real time, can give um, an intelligent overview so it allows councils and local authorities to be proactive with their road network rather than having to be reactive and in effect not using their assets as good as they could be. That's it from me. Well, thank you very much indeed, James. Um, you will have a chance to ask him questions in the question and answer section of the webinar. Um, please enter your questions now so we can be ready to put them to the panel. Now it's time to introduce uh, David Atkin, who is an analyst for Transport for Greater Manchester, to give the next presentation. Over to you now, David. Uh, hi, yes. Uh, my name's David, and my role at TFGM is to use data to support a number of the activities that fall under TFGM's remit. This includes everything from uh, crime and antisocial behaviour in trams and buses to congestion on the highway network. Hopefully, you'll have heard of TFGM and at least know where Greater Manchester is, but just to give a bit of background, um, Greater Manchester is a city region of around 2.8 million people and it's made up of 10 local authorities, with TFGM being the transport authority for the region. A few years ago, TFGM set out its vision for the uh, future of transport in its 2040 strategy. That vision is for a transport system so that supports long-term sustainable economic growth and enables access and opportunity for all. And while we need to acknowledge the challenges of the last six months and the challenge that we will continue to face, that long-term plan for delivering a cleaner, greener, more prosperous city region is more relevant than ever. and fits well with an expression that I've hear been hearing a lot recently, which is to build back better. So I've pulled together a few slides which give some examples of how we have used data over the last six months to understand how travel behaviour has changed and inform some operational decisions. Uh, so this slide just shows the range of data sources that we have access to. We have uh, more data sources than the blue blobs that are on there, but we have, uh, broadly speaking, we have our own kit. So we have... Um, uh, ATCs and we have some of the uh, vivacity sensors that we've just heard about. We get information from our customers via social media surveys in the con contact center. Um, they through our partners, big, com big tech companies like Google and mobile phone companies. And um, we don't just use the data internally and hold on to it once we have it. We, uh, we join it up and we make sense of it and we pass it on to uh, partners such as Greater Manchester Police, big trip generators like Manchester Airport, the local authorities, combined authorities, bus operators and things like that. So through the pandemic there's been a greater focus on data, you hear it in the news that we're going to make, you know, let data lead the decision and we're waiting on the data to inform uh, what we're going to do and perhaps because of this um, there's certainly been a greater willingness to share data and to promote initiatives um, that will improve our access to data. So uh, certainly in my role, that's uh, been a good thing. Next slide, please. Uh, so at a macro level, we wanted to understand what total demand for travel was and uh, the modal split uh, that we had on the network. And so to do this, we took all the ticketing, patronage, highways, demand data that we had, and we combined that with some uh, baseline and travel diary information to provide an estimate of total demand in GM. Uh, we then compare, compare this to some mobile phone data that we had from O2 and there was a, a pretty good fit between the two data sets. Uh, both the data sets estimated that the trip level bottomed out at 33%, so a third of pre-pandemic trips um, were being made. And um, that's what the chart shows on the table there, just some numbers. And then um, something that we also noticed and something that we, we need to note was that while 
the reduction in car trips had some desirable effects in terms of air quality and congestion. There was also some less desirable effects as well in terms of the number of uh, vehicles travelling above the uh, the speed limit. So the um, the box there on the bottom left that just shows the as the volume of traffic fell, the uh, proportion of vehicles travelling above the speed limit increased, and you can see that it's a um, quite a pretty mirror image of one another. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this uh, this slide is uh, derived from the mobile phone data that we received, and um, it's quite useful. gave us some useful insights. Um, you can see the blue line there, which was uh, Rochdale, uh, one of the districts in Greater Manchester, had a different half term in February. But then you can also pick out things like the grey line, which is uh, Manchester, which has the kind of central business district in it. They um, they started working from home or reduced their commute trips earlier than any other uh, district in Greater Manchester. And this information um, not only tells us about what happened then, we might be able to use it to predict what happens in the future. So if you, they probably started working from home because it was easier for them to work in home, they've got a higher proportion of um, people employed in the service sector. The uh, maybe they will be the last to go back to work because it's uh, you know easier than easier for them to stay at home and that blue line which we identified earlier which was Rochdale they maintain the higher highest level of commute trips um, through the pandemic and again that's probably linked to so socio-economic factors and the types of employment in the area so there's um, higher levels of employment in manufacturing and logistics in Rochdale for example uh, yeah next slide please Uh, so this is uh, again the mobile phone data and this is all trips and again we can identify some uh, useful things still before lockdown useful things that can inform decisions uh, in uh, a, you know a post pandemic era so the uh, the spikes you can see there prior to lockdown in the uh, in Trafford district th those were um, match day events at Old Trafford and so you can see the impact that a, that a uh, an event um, like a football match at Old Trafford has on trip levels. So um, certainly in terms of risk and understanding uh, what the impacts of having a big event like that, it's not just about what goes on in the stadium. You can see there that the impact it has on mobility and trip levels um, in that uh, authority. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the uh, questions we were asked, one of the challenges put to the team was to estimate the impact of returning traffic in September. Obviously schools were going back, that would uh, free up uh, parents from 24-7 childcare and also there would be some changes to the furlough scheme where uh, employers would have to contribute away so we might see an increase in commute trips. So we wanted to try and estimate what the impact of that was. So we had some travel diary information which uh, gave us the size of the total market um, but on the highway network what we did was we we um, in order to, pre to predict what would happen this year we our starting position was well what what happened last year so we uh, we held the level of chips we had at the beginning at the end of July sorry um, as a constant and then we applied to that the net impact or the net effect on trips in the highway network between uh, mid-August and mid-September from 2019 and that gave us our predicted level of trips for the um, return of schools and some commute trips and so uh, the two charts there um, the one on the left it was our prediction based on that and the one on the right is the actual based on that so it's the same um, end of July picture with the, the actual change between um, August and September applied and so we weren't too far away with our prediction um, showing that there would still be some capacity uh, in the peaks um, on the highway network. So that was useful in uh, in um, planning and um, and, uh, and and while we we understood there wouldn't be um, significant congestion across the conurbation, what it, what we did identify was that there would likely to be some issues um, locally, uh, potentially around schools. Uh, and so that led to some uh, hotspot analysis. So can I have the next slide, please? 
so again, uh, to do this hotspot analysis, uh, we used historic data to show the level of congestion around schools. We also um, made an estimate of um, how many pupils travelled by bus to uh, school. And what this did was that this gave us an idea of where we might see congestion based on historic figures, if there was any because there's historic congestion problems there, and also if there was any drift from public to private mode. If you've already got a historic congestion problem and you see an increased demand for private vehicle trips, you might have a worse congestion around the school. And then we also uh, looked at where there's not just demand, but also the supply of the road networks, where there would be restrictions in uh, the capacity, either from roadworks or some of the uh, temporary walking and cycle measures that have been put in use. And uh, we use this uh, information to um, identify where we would want to put uh, duplicate bus services to increase um, capacity on the public transport network. It informed our comms marketing and travel demand management activity. And uh, it also informed uh, corridor management activity around um, traffic signal timings and working with the districts to see if there was anything we could do if there were roadworks in the area, such as um, which hours we're operating, what, do, what are we going to classify as a peak period. Uh, next slide, please. So this is cycling. Um, for me, this is a good example of how the way we've used data has changed through the pandemic. Uh, historically, cycling was reported on more of a strategic basis, for example, a 12 month rolling average but we were much keener to see week on week, even day by day, how cycling levels um, had changed. Um, and um, we certainly saw a surge in cycling uh, through the initial part of lockdown. And uh, there's some charts there on the left, which show the estimate that we've put together from the kit that we had access to, which were the um, automatic cycle counters and the vivacity sensors that we have access to. And then the chart below that is uh, information that comes from Strava, so an independent uh, data source. And they both show a similar thing, that there was that surge in cycling through uh, May and June. Uh, and then the charts on the right there show that there's been a change in the time recently that we've been seeing cyclists on the network. So a lot, a lot of the growth in cycling um, were possibly those kind of Strava type trips, which were on the uh, off-road routes and was uh, more maybe cycling for uh, exercise. Whereas the um, the cycling we see now, it's it's more concentrated in the peak times, or there's certainly greater growth in the uh, in peak time cycling. So that suggests there's been an increase in utility cycle trips for commuting and all other things. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, some information we have on walking activity. So um, just like cycling. Um, which can happen uh, across the network, as we as we heard in the previous talk, people can and will walk anywhere. So it's quite a difficult mode to uh, to monitor. And so um, the chart below is pulled together from the um, from the information we get from the vivacity sensors in the um, regional centre, and you can see the impact of uh, of different um, things and different um, policies on the uh, on the walking activity. So you can see the impact of the bank holiday there on the uh, amount of activity in the regional centre on the Sunday. And also, if you look at Wednesday, the, um, the orange Wednesday, that was the impact of the last uh, day of the um, Eat Out to Help Out scheme. And so certainly in the city centre and looking at that walking profile and the thing and the profile that we saw in the highway network, the, it was much more akin to a, a Friday than a Wednesday with people trying to make the most of that scheme while it was uh, which was, while it was in place. So I guess this is evidence to suggest that people made good use of the scheme and it, and it was a good good thing for the hospitality sector. Uh, so yeah, that that's the uh, that's the end of the slides. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, David. Um, you'll have a, a chance to ask him questions in the Q and A section of the webinar. Um, please enter your questions now. Um, and identify it, please, as a question uh, for David, and then we'll put them to the panel at the end. Uh, now it's time to introduce uh, Llewellyn Morgan, who is Head of Innovation for Oxfordshire County Council, and he is now on camera and ready to go. Over to you, Llewellyn. Cheers. 
Okay, cool. Let's move on to the next one straight away. Just as a background um, to explain who we are, um, we're, we're slightly unusual um, from the public sector point of view because um, we're an innovation service in um, in a council, in a county council. Um, we grew from transport projects. Um, and we started out about five years ago, uh, but now we cover all the services across the council. Transport's probably still 60 to 70% of our projects. As a, as, a, as a legacy, but we're doing quite a lot more projects now in public health, um, particularly a lot more in energy, and also we have a social care innovation team. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so because because we have ever decreasing uh, money as a, as a local authority, and I'm sure everyone else has the, the joys of not being uh, funded by the government for our COVID expenditure, so we're always under more pressure to try and meet our costs. So I, I put this in every slide now because we're effectively selling ourselves even more. Um, but we've um, we've been lucky to be successful with quite a few projects, and we've um, the total um, value of the projects that we've worked on so far is about just over 135 million now, um, and they're primarily projects that focus on Oxfordshire. So for us, it's a bit of an economic growth um, element to it as well as. Uh, bringing um, hopefully new solutions that solve some of our long-standing problems in the county. Uh, next slide. So yeah, so with, with transport, I suppose when we're trying to think about what we're trying to do with the rest of our teams is um, we're sort of trying to build that, that living lab framework for want of a better word. Um, so we're trying to really push to the point where we can get an, a decent enough data and insight and also tools to use that data to get to that world where we can move maybe slightly more away from predict and provide to more of an iterate and adapt. Um, I'm not sure you're ever going to be always doing just iterate and adapting. There's going to be some um, vision and prediction, I think, always. But we believe that um, having that agility and that adaptability is about how it, it will have a, will mean you have a much more resilient city so that's what we've been trying to do with all the projects is build some sort of legacy that we uh, benefit from as an authority as well as the project living the project itself so next project next slide um so you heard um jane from vivacity talk about uh, the work they do um yeah so we one of our bigger projects with um data or earlier did bigger projects with was with vivacity we've now got i think it's about 80 cameras in the city it's going to be expanding to um over 100 in oxford and then we've also got there's about 15 more i think it is around in in uh, between vista and didcot um supplied by the various different projects so we put vivacity cameras into oxford to count cyclists so although it's brilliant because it gives us multimodal data, uh, which we use for lots of other purposes in terms of counting all movement, but primarily that we put it into uh, count cyclists because although Oxford has a high level of cycling use, we actually had really poor data um, on, on where people cycled, when they cycled. Um, and so this was a hampering our, um, our, our cycling and walking strategies. Um, so these have been a great tool for us. So um, I won't go over how they work because James has done that, but what we've also done re recently, I think was in July, I think it was, we've also put this data out um, on an open website. So it's called Oxbyte. There's a little screenshot from it at the bottom. Um, you can get information from bicycles, cyclists, um, cycling cars, pedestrians, and buses as well. So you just click through it. And it also shows a bit of the historical pattern. So this We've got quite a, an active travel group, um, active cyclist group. They were very pleased to see this because they want to see um, the data that we're using to inform some of our plans, but they can also use it to lobby against us, which they're totally free to do. Um, and I'm sure they have plenty of good ideas as well. So we this came out and actually it was quite well received. Um, and it's really interesting data. So, I mean, just as an indicator, um, We've also got Strava data and CSense data that we're putting into an internal platform as well. So Strava is the general uh, movement data you get. CSense are the little smart lights, um, and they have things like braking incidences and also um, 
uh, they 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 quantify the quality of the road so that if, you, if it's really rough it'll get a bad score so we've got data like that that we're overlaying as well which is really helpful for um, both the active travel work that we're doing but also the longer term work that we're looking at doing in terms of investing in cycling use in um, in the city um, and just that it was interesting hearing Dave talk about the, the, the Strava data showing more people the peaks have changed our peaks have changed as well but the other way around so most of our peaks are in the peak so we have a lot of cyclists who used cycling as a mode to get to work and during lockdown the peaks disappeared but a lot more daytime use so we had a reverse of less people commuting and more people using it for leisure and exercise um, so it was just interesting to hear that um, next slide one of the other things we did last year which was, which was really good so this was a sort of a shoestring budget project we did it with the open data institute didn't have a lot of money so we built um a, a tool that attached to esri the esri gis it's our main gis tool um and and then we um this was built as a as an app for users and we put it out amongst the community site so again the cycling community primarily and this is primarily outside of Oxfordshire, so this is outside of Oxford. So we wanted more data about what the network looked like and issues um, in the towns outside of Oxford. So this was primarily done in Whitney and, and Wallingford, a little bit around Vista and Didcot as well. And members of the public essentially um, took the tool and they were able to indicate quite accurately where there are issues on the cycling network. And this could be anything from massive potholes to uh, cycle lanes overgrown or areas where they found thought it was just dangerous um, and, in, and reasons why someone might not cycle and this has been really useful um, in, uh, in, uh, in response to the COVID in that we've been able to prioritise areas where we knew the um, cycle lanes became overgrown um, because of our fault, it's poor maintenance but at least we knew where to look at um, those areas and so that's been really useful and worked really well in particularly in Whitney where they've done a lot of work um, as a town council to promote active travel um, so that was a really helpful bit of information and actually relatively low cost to get that sort of community information and that on the ground information so we are, we now have that overlapped with the previous data as well next slide so just looking at um, one of our innovation projects that we've done recently. This is a project that was funded by Highways England. It was an innovation um, award. It was led by um, Ameson and Siemens. And um, we actually worked with them on it, essentially as a subcontractor in this instance. Um, and this was looking at um, air quality issues that we have in a part of Oxford called Botley, which um, is very close to the A34. Essentially, the A34 goes over Botley. Um, and it causes a particular issue right over a quite a large school. So it's a pertinent issue um, in Oxford. What we were looking at here is to build, um, I suppose, the beginnings of whether you can cross analyze um, air quality, do look at real time traffic levels, and then um, also develop some predictive analytics over, over based on historical patterns to help you then better manage the network. So we're looking at whether you can manage the network to um, reduce the, the impact um, from vehicles on the air quality. And this may even have an, it may be something where um, we put congestion on our network to make sure the A34 runs better because overall there's, there's, um, there's better air quality for um, people in Oxford. So this is something we're looking at um we've done all the testing and phasing now we cross we've, we've put in 20 new earth sense air quality sensors and we use another platform called map air which looks at um weather um and also historic air quality conditions and that all goes through um into a, an, a, an artificial intelligence processing system that aims and have built up that combines predictive analytics of the network so we're starting looking at predictive network management, essentially. Um, so we've run this virtually. We're going to um, do some real testing with it. Um, but obviously, COVID got in the way. So it's not a typical um, test scenario at the moment. But this is something we're looking at building much more in, um, into the future. And it's something we're combining into um, the potential use for our um, new transport model. 
uh, and look at really looking at predictive analytics and how we can use that for network management and hopefully try to start to do this across all modes as well not just managing the vehicles uh, next slide and just another one to touch on that might be of interest to people so we're part of a project called 5G Heart. It's a really big European project, a Horizon 2020 project. Um, and we are providing the test, the real world test bed for the University of Surrey, which is the UK's, one of the UK's top 5G test centers. Um, and this is looking at applications of um, data from vehicles. So it's, it's using the 5G networks to get um, data from the vehicles. And again, combining it with air quality um, but this is on a much bigger level. So this is looking at having air quality for about half the county in the test, essentially the whole of the county by the end of it. Um, with the end, actually the end of the project, we're looking at getting data from autonomous vehicles as well um, and looking at, at whether we can take some of the data that we get from autonomous vehicles like LIDAR data and um, the imaging data to give us all sorts of information, including like road conditioning, um, uh, tree growth um, and real-time issues that are happening on the network as well so it's sort of it's partly testing 5g but also looking at the future of what sort of data we might be able to get and what we need to think about um, in terms of uh, planning for for the future as a, as a highways uh, as a transport authority i think that's it next slide i think it's the last one yeah cool that's me Okay, thanks very much indeed, uh, Llewellyn. You will have a chance to ask Llewellyn questions at the end. Please type them into your question box and we will get to them uh, before the end of the session. Um, now it is time to introduce Giles uh, Lipscomb, who is a consultant in data analytics, modeling and visualization for ITP. Over to you, Giles. All right. Hello, uh, so my name is Giles Lipscomb. I'm a consultant at Integrated Transport Planning, which is a consultancy company. And today I'm gonna to show you how we use data in our work improving transport networks in the UK and around the world. So I generally work on international projects and most of the examples in this are things that I've worked on recently, but everything I'm gonna show you is applicable to the UK as well. And if anything, it's probably easier here because there's so much more data available. So next slide, please. Thank you. So this is a map of the overall method that we use in our work. So it will generally change depending on each project, but for the most part, you've got like five main stages. First one is defining your goals and objectives, very important. And so that helps you set out a scoring system that you will use later to evaluate your network. Uh, stages two and three is what I'm gonna talk about today is looking at the current situation. So that's your supply and your demand. So you want to see what you have and what your customers want from you. Number four is evaluating your network with a criteria that you defined in the first stage. So that's basically how well do you meet your goals right now. And then once you understand this, you can do step five, which is identifying where you need invest or improvements, investments, and then come up, coming up with ways to fix it. So you'll generally go around a few times, sort of like having an idea, testing it, uh, going back testing it again, et cetera, et cetera. But once you've done that, you should hopefully have something that works a lot better in the future. So next slide, please. Cool, okay, so talking about data. So I'll start with supply. So this is the public transport network in Manila in the Philippines, and it shows you the total uh, public transport frequency on each link in the city. Um, so you can see the main roads in red with lots of buses on them. But if you know the area, then straight away you can see problems. So if you look in the center right, there's a sort of a little green circle, which is Bonifacio Global City. It's a big employment center, but it's got green around it, so it doesn't have a lot of frequency. So that's obviously a prime target for intervention. But frequency can be misleading. So next slide, please. Um, so if you have a high frequency, but you've just got a bunch of small vehicles on there, you're not really moving that many people. So if we combine the frequencies from the map with the seat capacities of each uh, vehicle on each route, that gives you the overall sort of seat capacity in the network, which is very useful if you have a city where there's a, a mix of high and low capacity vehicles like in Manila. Uh, next slide, please. 
Okay, so GPS speeds. So this is Odessa in Ukraine. So if you have vehicle trackers, then you can use that same data, the GPS traces from those, to show your speeds on a map. So this is like useful for operational efficiency. Uh, so you can see basically where your vehicles are losing most of their time. So again, here in the center right, there's a dark red link. If you want to improve your efficiency, you can target interventions there, speed up your buses through there, and yeah, everything's good. Uh, so all of this is easy to do in the UK. The data is readily available. So yeah, <laughs> it's nice to do. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so demand. The main thing we'd talk about here would usually be origin destination surveys, but they are quite difficult to present because you just have a lot of lines over a map. Um, so we generally use it for calculations, but we don't do much visualization with it. We are working on a visualization tool, but it's not ready yet, so I'm afraid I can't share it with you, but maybe next year, I don't know. Um, instead, I'm gonna show you boarding and lighting data, which essentially shows where people get on and off of public transport vehicles. So this is obviously really useful for finding the most important places for your passengers. Um, that is not just origin and destination points, but also interchange locations. So in this map here, this is Kiev in Ukraine. You can see that lots of the points I've circled, those are actually on the metro lines. So it's a big interchange place. You can use exactly the same data to look at an individual route. So that, that graph on the right there is one route of many. Um, and so this shows you the loading sort of characteristics of that route along its length. So at the start, you have everyone getting on, those little blue lines. Nothing happens in the middle. This is a very point-to-point -point route with very little seat turnover. And then everyone gets off at the end. So you can use this data just to see what the routes in your city. And if you want to look at a particular route, you can. So in UK, we generally use ticketing data for this. That's not always available in developing countries. So we have a survey app called Transit Wand, where someone sits on the bus with the app on their phone. They count people getting on and off. And it also collects GPS traces, which you can use for your speed analysis. So next slide, please. Okay, so the analysis part. Big part of this is travel time modeling or accessibility modeling, which lets you see how well your supply meets your demand. So you can put a marker on the map and give it a network to play with, and it will show you how far you can get on public transport in a given time. So this example here is Manchester. And I made this in the middle of a lockdown where everyone was sort of going nuts about COVID. So it's kind of very hospital focused, but the bright blue, so there's four bright blue areas, which show you how far you can get from the four big hospitals in 30 minutes on the sort of normal timetable in 2019 before COVID. But the red shows you how far you could get in May this year in the middle of lockdown when they were running a reduced timetable. So you can see how accessibility is restricted. So you can't get so far. And the effect of that is more pronounced further out from the city center. Uh, it's a lot easier to understand if you can put numbers to it, but it becomes a lot more intuitive. So um, in the background, those sort of like pale gray, blue sort of color is the areas where there are lots of healthcare workers without access to cars. So we made that from a combination of a couple of census tables. And so if you know where basically healthcare workers live, you can say, you can characterize this by saying like, well, say for this hospital, 500 staff will find it more difficult to get to work every morning because the public transport network doesn't serve them so well at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. So this is exactly the same software, the same sort of data sets, but where the last one shows you how far you can get from one or two specific locations, this sort of characterizes the whole city based on how well connected each area is. So this example is Kiev, and it shows you what proportion of all jobs in the city that you can reach in an hour from any point. So we're doing a project in Trishna at the moment, so I've circled it. And from there, you can get to about 40% of jobs, if, like, if you're in one of the better places in the area, compared to 70% if you live in the city center. So the project we're doing is gonna put a new rapid transit line into the city center. So the idea is that you can sort of get you can access more jobs in the same amount of time, which would mean on this map, it would turn Troeshna yellow, and if it works really well, then it would make it go red. 
Uh, so you don't have to do this for just jobs. Anything you can place on a map, so as a point, you can do it. So you could have access to schools or access to shops or pretty much anything you want, really. And uh, next slide, please. Cool. So this is my last slide. And so the last two slides I've shown you are made with a program called Conveil Analysis, which is a piece of software we use because it's very fast and it lets you change things on the fly. So these two videos are both sort of real-time screen recordings of the software. And in the right-hand video, you can see that you can move the marker around so you can test the accessibility to a different place and it only takes a couple of seconds to calculate. You can also uh, make some changes, like you'd add in a new route if you want, just like click, 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 put in a route. Or you can modify existing routes, you can change the frequency or the capacity, and that again takes maybe a couple of minutes. The, the big, uh, oops, the timer. Uh, yeah, the big benefit is basically that it's very collaborative. So you can sit down with some stakeholders, you can test different ideas, and you can do it in real time as you're talking to them. The only downside is that it uses GTFS data as an input, so that's root and timetable data, and UK traditionally uses TransExchange. Because of that, there isn't, like not many tools support TransExchange because there's not such a big market for it. But while we can use TransExchange, we, we have to use different software that's not quite so fancy. So having GTFS lets us or other consultants or your own data teams do more things with the same data that you already have. And yeah, so finally, I'd like to say thank you, especially to TFGM and West Midlands and Nottingham City Transport, amongst others, who I can't think of right now, I'm sorry. Um, but they've released their own GTFS feeds, which is fantastic. And it's really good for us and them. And it's a really positive sort of forward thinking step. And I think it's really good to highlight that. So yeah, double thanks to Manchester, because I used your data in my example earlier. Uh, yes, that's me. Thank you very much for listening. If you would like to know more with less of a time limit on it, um, you can contact us at, oh, sorry, next slide, please, um, at the email address or the website on the slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giles, for your presentation. So that's uh, all four presentations now. So it's now time to put your questions to the speakers. Uh, I will read them out um, and address them to the speakers. Um, I'll put some questions to each of the speakers so that everyone has a chance to um, answer questions about their uh, presentation and I'll circle back to any of the questions we haven't picked up. Uh, so keep typing them into the box, um, the question box, and we will keep on um, coming back to them. So let's go back to the beginning um, and let's address a, a couple of questions to James. So the first one I want to pick out is from uh, Andrew Pritchard, um, who asks, how far can you use um, the Vivacity system to monitor destinations of traffic? This can be key to suggesting um, or implementing alternative routes, e.g. heavy traffic, to provide more space for cycling. Yeah, <clears throat> okay, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, it will depend on uh, the mounting of the centre itself. So actually within the field of view, we typically do up sort of 50 metres. However, if you're looking at a congestion um, side of things, then what we could do is journey times out of that. So one centre to another centre to another centre, effectively we can then create a network of journey times, um, actually which we're doing uh, in Nottingham, um, as Charles mentioned earlier. Um, but we're doing that in Nottingham at the moment, producing journey times on an arterial route into the city centre. Kind of on mute. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it's a classic. It's a classic mistake. Um, do, it, are you able to get matches on um, the same object um, at, from different cameras in the Vivacity system, so that you can you can actually track people as they move? Yeah, you can build it up into sort of knowledge and destination um, platform. And what we do is we also have the ability to produce paths on that as well. So. As soon as something enters the field of view, it'll track it across it, and you'll see it leave it. Um, and then obviously, if there is another sensor covering the next part of the area, you'll be able to pick it up. And pick it up from there. So, just so you, can, you can actually track. Track. You can track somebody in a yellow duffel coat who appears in one place, and then on another camera, and then on another camera. 
it probably won't be um, it won't be done in the yellow duffel coat uh, scenario so it will just be literally you'll pick up a pedestrian walking along that a particular track and then if they carry on that track it'll pick them up again on the next and feed from there um, it doesn't uh, obviously pick up colors as such as yet um, it is something sort of going for the future that we will, we will look at as well but at the moment uh, certainly on origin destination and journey times that's mainly for vehicular traffic um, so obviously we pick it up from sort of number plates which we hash and obviously the gdpr compliant at that front okay um second question um to you um that has come from daniel harborn um how accurate is the social distancing monitoring uh, are accurate distances possible from the camera footage that you get yeah it's um it is it is very accurate um however uh the one big caveat on this uh is that obviously you cannot uh from a from a single camera uh, view you cannot tell who is in a family unit uh so we could say that there is quite a lot of uh, interactions but among amongst a group of people but if it's one family then obviously that's not uh, affecting a social distancing situation so yes the accuracy is high but there is a big there is a caveat on that it's obviously it doesn't detect who is in a family unit so that will affect obviously the, the accuracy going forward i think that yeah. I, I, I also answers a question by martin lab laban um who was asking about how you identify uh, groups and bubbles um to ensure hotspots uh, are, are not identified when a group could or should be together such as families um, we don't have that information i, I assume no, the the only way of uh, putting across that point of view is though, if a group comes together within a, in a hot spot area, you will see the traces of people coming in. Um, so it may be that they are from different, but obviously we don't know if they're from a particular family unit. But we can actually produce from the traces where they come into a certain area, if they are, um, uh, if if they're all stuck within one single area. So unfortunately, again, it does, it goes back to the family unit situation whereby. If they are in a family unit, obviously they probably won't be social distancing. Um, but uh, it's it's it gives you an oversight of um, particularly useful if you if you have a two-way traffic scenario on particularly pedestrianisation areas um, where people are asked to be travelling on the left, people travelling on the right. Actually, are they getting closer than they should be to the two metres? Yeah. So um, that captures all those people who are going the wrong way through um, um, through, through uh, one way systems we, we have a, a rail bridge um, close to where I live uh, that has um, two one-way systems and uh, nobody obeys the rules and so everybody is constantly oh sorry you know um, so we're still we're still getting used to all of that I think um, yeah, can we move on to um, to David now um, and put a question uh, to him um, David a question from Paul Jackson uh, he says great to see how data layering and integration can be effective um what are your key specific knowledge or data gaps um the yeah we, we've, we've where do we start the uh i think um a lot of the time we have kit uh, particularly around walking and cycling where um where there's been investment in uh, walking and cycling infrastructure and this doesn't necessarily provide you with the sample you'd need to provide a, a robust estimate based on network type and geography and so certainly that's that's an area where if we had some money to invest i'd look to uh, address that issue i think there's a there's a certainly post pandemic if you um you know, TFGM has a modelling suite like a lot of transport authorities and that's been made up of um, surveys and assumptions and mobile phone data that's been built up over a number of years to understand how people travel, when people are travelling, where they travel from and to and now in this post-pandemic situation travel behaviour has changed quite a bit and so we, it would be good to have a source of information that we could validate all those assumptions that are in that model and say okay this is something completely new there's a new normal we need to um, update our models to reflect this or whether um, or whether we can there's a point at which we're close enough back to normal where we can you know start to rely on those assumptions again so I think sort of uh, yeah those are the two key areas I think I'd look at 
Okay, um, so we, we had only that question currently I'd, um, uh, addressed to you, David. So um, let me move on to uh, Llewellyn and we'll circle back to you. I'm sure there'll be more questions um, uh, a little bit later. Um, so a uh, question for you, Llewellyn, um, from Annabelle Precious. Um, how far back does the Oxbike data recorded by Vivacity go? How much analysis has been completed to understand how cycle patterns have changed following the recent investments in cycling? Um, so our Vivacity data goes back it's about 18 months. Um, um, so, and that, that's Oxford focused. Uh, we, I think in terms of the, we've just put in a new route, we've just put in a new route in Headington and that's come in. So that's the only one, that's the only new bit of infrastructure we put in that's that we're, where we've been able to look at before and after data. But it's pretty hard to tell at the moment because we finished it during COVID. So it's sort of all the data is skewed somewhat at the moment. Um, I mean, in terms of what we're trying to build it into now is that one of the reasons why we're in-house trying to combine the various data sets is to build a, a simplest uh, tool as possible as a sort of dashboard that will bring in um, so we can look at the Vivacity data, Strava data, CSense data and some of the other data that we've got um, to allow our transport planners to monitor the effectiveness of especially the tranche two um, funding that we because we're we're putting in, well, we're aiming to put in some controversial things that um, a couple of bus gates that effectively stop traffic going into Oxford. And so we're going to do a lot of monitoring on that. Um, and that's partly built off increasing active travel. So they're going to be heavily monitored, um, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to get Elk Spike out, because they're going to be monitored by people as well. We know that. Um, so Are you using um, temporary TROs to do most of these changes. Yeah. So you yeah. know, was quite short notice to local people. Yeah, so they're either going to be done on temporary or experimental TROs. So we don't know yet. The bus gates have been advertised as being a temporary solution. Um, but if you do it on an experimental TRO, you can make them permanent. Um, and the bus gates are always part of our longer term vision for how we manage the city and the zero emission zones anyway. So that's a debate. Um, but obviously we've got a lot of work to do with managing access for businesses into the centre. Um, so yeah, so we. But again, this data, the data we've got through the through the Vasti Lab cameras as well, um, allows us to look at active monitoring, which we've not been able to do before. Um, and and like I was saying, it allows us to start to think about being able to iterate and adapt. Um, so that's what we're trying to. So internally, try to encourage that way of thinking. Let's think of a measure that can be quite. It can look potentially quite temporary, but if it starts to have a really clear positive impact, then we reinforce that and make it permanent, not think of this thing, it's got to work, it might not work, it doesn't matter we put it in now. Um, you know, it's it took five years to put it in anyway. It's just, you know, let's put temporary things in, um, which can become a bit controversial. And that's where the data's got to be good, because we know already in Oxford, even with the idea of the bus gates, we get, we'll get really questioned about the data that we've used to, um, to do something and then to monitor it. Okay, uh, another question for you from Andrew Pritchard. Um, how much change in air quality do you expect to achieve by, introduce, uh, by introducing network management? The cha so I suppose I don't think you're going to get drastic change overall. What, you, what we're looking to do there is to manage the worst. So you get in Oxford when issues happen on the network, you get really drastic peaks. So the aim there, I mean, bearing in mind this is the right at the beginning of, of this is a project really. Um, it's a proof of concept that we've got through to um, the first couple of stages. Um, so yeah, it's it's I think it's more around reducing the peaks than reducing a sort of the overall air quality. I mean, the, our main aim for reducing air quality in Oxford is to reduce move cars from the city centre. Um, and, and try and move people onto active travel and, and zero emission public transport. So that's the ultimate aim. But this, this hopefully will look to how look at how we can reduce those peaks. And the reason why it was a high was England project is that it's looking at applicability across the country. And when you get those nasty peaks, particularly off the strategic network. Okay, 
Um, moving on then to Giles, a question from John McKillop. Um, Giles, ticketing data is good for boarding, but how is it helping with alighting information? That's a perennial bus surveying question. Any uh, any uh, uh, any response on that one? Um, yeah, well, in the perfect world, you'd have sort of like tap on and tap off data as well. Um, we can record both, especially with our survey app, Transit Wand. Um, so at least in international projects, most of the time we do that because we don't have um, the like any ticketing data because a lot of the time it's just cash. Um, so I suppose, yeah, we can record both with the data we have in the UK. Yeah, it might just be sometimes the best we can do is boarding and not alighting. Um, so uh, yeah, you'd have to supplement it with something like surveys. We have got some bus operators, I think, experimenting with uh, with tap off uh, in the UK, but it's it's still relatively rare. And, and there are, of course, um, post paid um, services like uh, Fair Tick, for example, that just uh, monitor you um, by by GPS and Wi-Fi when they detect that you're on some transport. They check you in, and when you get off, they check you off. Uh, and so, I think they're, they're headquartered in Switzerland. I think they have some quite rich data on this kind of on this kind of thing. So, okay, um, that's a first run through. Um, I think we've got a bit more time um, to take questions. So, I'd like to go back um, to uh, to James. Um, there were a few questions, um, James, about costs and speed of deployment of your technology. Now, I'm not sure you want to get into costs or not. Um, I'll leave that to you. But um, people were obviously thinking, this is this is great, but is it cost, going to cost me an arm and a leg and take a year to put in? Can you enlighten them? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I'll take the first question, the last question first, uh, if I may. Um, so, yeah, in terms of uh, implementation, it's very, very simple. Um, if you compare it to sort of the legacy equipment around uh, where there's normally uh, unfortunately you're either digging up the road or you're having to put boxes um, on the side road and, and plumb them in the data feeds etc it's very very simple um, we take the power um, from the street furniture itself which again is very low around sort of 14 watts um, and uh, again installation of that is typically uh, very easy to do because you don't tend to have to have traffic management because you can do it on on the side of on, on the side of the road um, and from there the comms again is very very small um, it tends to be a three or four G sim card so again very cheap to use um, just purely because uh, the processing of the uh, data is actually done on edge so it's actually done on the unit itself um, so in terms of implementation we've uh, you know from uh, my my workshop are probably going to shoot me, but I'm hoping it's not, none of them on the call. Um, but I'm pretty sure from one uh, one where we received a PO, we could actually we actually had the we had several of them up installed um, within within five days. So um, that was pushing it, obviously, because uh, there is obviously validation and calibration to be done. Um, but for that particular project, um, particularly with the first tranche of uh, the active travel funding that came out. Um, we were uh, under quite a lot of pressure to get a lot of these, um, a lot of uh, the new interactions covered. So, in terms of invitation, very easy. Um, cost, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's always a perennial question. It's basically because it's the the way they work is there's obviously economies of scale. The more you buy, the cheaper they get. Simple as that. Um, there's very also there's different layers um, in terms of the capabilities within the sensor. Um, right up from just having you know, the most basic form where you just have a, a single count only sensor that's uh, not classifying it's literally just counting anything that goes past it um, right up to having a sensor that can do um, classified counts with journey times and uh, speed and uh, occupancy data and path data which some of those are coming at a later stage because we're just redoing it at the API um, but yeah so there is a varying scale depending on what um, what the usage case is for each sensor what we um, Oxford for instance also uh, Llewellyn's project there they were all very much just keying in on the active travel side of things so they just wanted path data and uh, classified counts 
where we have again uh, the project in um, uh, Nottingham, for instance. Again, that was one where they wanted journey times as well as classified counts. So what we did on the network there was we mixed and matched the different capabilities and sensors. So obviously that that does that does a cost um, effectively again, obviously with TFGM as well. Um, a lot of sensors that we've uh, deployed there are because it's just for active travel and they just want um, path data and classified counts. So it's it's cost really dependent on numbers and capability. So the cost drivers then for you are the number of locations, the amount of back-end processing, um, any, any other key cost drivers? So people, I mean, so uh, Thomas Lancaster asked the question about you know, how much would it cost to monitor an installation of a new cycleway or a new pedestrian crossing? Um, mm. uh, yeah, are those are the cost price. drivers, back end, and and you know number of in, in, uh, cameras installed. Yeah, it, it's 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 pretty much on the number of sensors installed. Really, the back end costs are actually very minimal, um, which is which is, is 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 a simple one to do. So it really depends on the size of, of the interaction that's being put in there. Um, we've done one in Cambridge, which is quite a large um, sighting roundabout, where uh, normally you would probably only have to have one on each arm, but because of the complications of it being sort of Dutch star roundabout, had to put more on there. Plus, we they wanted to monitor. Um, rat runs coming off it as well. So, what would have been a simple, you know, probably four sensors to cover the entire area turned into a 12 sensor because just basically the amount of data they wanted to collect, they wanted journey times coming into the uh, into the roundabout. They also wanted to see how much traffic was using these different rat runs while the uh, roundabout was being um, adjusted to a new cycle roundabout. Okay, let's let's turn to Strava as a source. Uh, Peter Ashworth asked a question: um, whether or not Strava data is skewed towards people cycling for exercise. Uh, he says, um, "I assume a mum doing a school run by bike isn't tracking her journey by Strava. It's clearly rich data. Would there be value in equally rich data which represents a broader demographic demographic of cyclists?" Now, a few of you talked about this. Who, who would like to answer answer a question or talk about how you can ensure that the data you get from Strava is balanced? Llewellyn or Dave? I can. So we've we've only had Strava data since May. So my understanding with the data set we're getting is that they do this. So, so they try to provide a level of um, calculation for all users. So they give a sort of indication level. As well as an overall count level, so they do they do try to account for this. Um, we haven't validated this yet, um, and, and tried to see how accurate it is. Um, I, I would say it's remarkable how many people do use Strava for even the most mundane journeys. That's what I found. <laughs> um, but I was just noting it. But uh, it's um, and we've, what we've also got is a lot more people, um, a lot more walking data than we expected. And it's literally track, you know, showing routes of people walking into work. Um, I don't know why. Um, so um, I mean, some of these things sort of amuse. I, I have no interest in ever um, tracking my walk in a cycling data, <laughs> but as people do it. It's useful. I'm glad they do. It's really useful. So what? What? So the data has become more useful as they've spent a bit more time, um, I suppose, calibrating it to give an overall in, indicator. But you, it, what you can't do there is. We haven't gone to the level of saying of validating it like we would say, uh, um, like we would for um, the levels of car use for a model to really understand the the, mode, the, the validation levels. But it's something we're you interested in looking at. You mean you haven't had time to do it, or you don't intend to do it? Um, we haven't had time to do it. We've only had it since May, and it wasn't a priority. <laughs> we will. We're going to look at it probably down some corridors. Um, and um, and look at what it what it's indicating. But we, yeah, at the moment we're just using it as an indicator. The the reason I the, the reason I ask is um, uh, I, I'm sure that like most people here um, that they're on a WhatsApp group on their street. Everybody's everybody's on a WhatsApp group on their street, and that's a great soapbox, you know, for all local transport issues. And it's dawning on people on my street now that um, some of these changes that are occurring are going to actually cause them. Force them to change their behaviour, and so now they're they're drilling down 
on the evidence um, and they're wanting that you know they're becoming a bit more active in wanting to understand why the decisions are being taken what the justifications are so I suspect yeah. that some of the data sets will come under more challenge would you agree yeah. with that Dave would you have a view on that yeah well uh, I think as well on the Strava thing it's something to bear in mind is that it's a it's a commercial product so you know if you think about say Hoover Strava the Hoover of the uh, active travel tracking it only takes a Dyson to come along to shake up the uh, the market and so if some of that app which offered better features or better performance came along then you might see a, a fall in Strava trips and users which isn't related to a change in active travel it's just the the market changing and so uh, I think you, you know when we're using when we're partnering with a commercial partner or using their data I think you've also got to bear that in mind as well the the validation we've done it, albeit just a small, shows that it fits reasonably well with what we're getting from the uh, from the um, traditional automatic cycle count kit that we're getting. So it's, it showed that same surge through uh, May and June in cycling activity. Uh, well, we have mums that uh, take their kids to school on this very uh, webinar. So uh, Fiona McAnally um, says, as a mum, as part of my commute, I use Strava to link into my watch for counting steps and energy and mileage per day. Um, so um, th there are clearly a lot of different um, uh, dimensions to that Strava data. And perhaps what this is telling us is we need to do some validation on it just to see if we can't um, uh, get a better handle on what that data looks like. And I guess, you know, across a lot of the data sets that we've got here, um, this is going to be the challenge um, in the current situation is validating as much of it as possible. So um, another question. Um, so question from Eleanor Chappell um, for everybody. Um, have panelists been involved in modeling transport usage according to protected characteristics? For example, reviewing differences in journey pattern by age, gender, or ethnicity. Have you done it? Was it successful? Does anybody want to come in on that? Maybe Giles? Um, yes. Um, I mean, I haven't personally, but I know one of my colleagues um, in our London office did a project, I think it was Port Moresby, um, which <laughs> I, no, I'm not that great at geographies. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Um, We're learning from everywhere, that's brilliant. So, yeah, the project of that was that it wanted to model how women travel as opposed to sort of men, because it's there's big safety issues in that. So women are not, they don't feel safe on public transport, essentially. And the measures they take to um, sort of like to keep themselves safe, essentially, restrict the accessibility that they have on the network so they can't reach so many places or if they do they have to wait until a bus comes along which they feel safer on compared to one which is packed um, so the way we modeled that was we uh, we modeled it as half the frequency as a man's trip so you have to wait at, at the bus stop for twice as long and we also restricted the particular bus stops that would be used so you just say well, like that stop isn't safe so if they're just not going to use it so if you, we only kept the bus stops, I think, with high visibility. And yeah, it's quite quite depressing, really, when you see the difference. OK, um, while um, uh, thanks for that. I, I didn't expect Papua New Guinea to come into this conversation, but uh, useful, useful that it did. Um, on the question that was asked about um, a lighting, um, one of the organisers from Randall Links has, has sent me a chat message saying TFL also estimates bus alighting data using a big data tool that looks at origin, destin and bus interchange information, uh, which it calls ODX. It combines bus location and ticketing data to try and match up origin and destination pairs to create a, a multimodal travel data set. So just a bit of um, further information um, on that. Um, one more question, um, James, for you that came in from Martin Laban. Um, how are different shapes categorized in uh, Vivacity sensors? Uh, wheelchair users, push chairs, recumbent cycles, even? Ah, price, yes. That's a challenge. Well, it's, uh, yeah, the, two is, the great thing about machine learning is the fact that you can, you can teach the machine to recognize anything virtually. 
um, in terms of where we are at this precise moment in time, um, as I said, we had the nine categories, hopefully you saw it in uh, one of my slides there. However, we are teaching it to, um, to, to the training model to basically recognize e-scooters and wheelchairs are uh, also on the agenda as well. Um, now, obviously, it takes time for the system to learn. Um, there are different types of wheelchair, um, as it is, different types of e-scooters as well, I'm sure. Um, but as a time, it takes thousands and thousands of different photographs for the system to learn accurately uh, and be able to recognize it accurately going forward. Um, so I guess to answer your question, um, yes, it could recognize anything. It's just a question of what the demand will be for the system to recognize it. Um, so obviously there's, uh, because of the nature of the, the training that is required, um, it's a very, uh, it's a very thorough and long process. It's just a question of it's, it's the usual supply and demand. If there is a demand for it out there in the marketplace that um, different types of transportation methods are required, we will obviously look at that and, and train it into the train, uh, train it into our training set. Okay, well, um, I think we're pretty much out of time now. Um, this has been an extremely interesting, um, valuable seminar. Um, thank you to those of you who are um, in the audience for attending the webinar today. We hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to thank all of our presenters uh, on your behalf. A special thanks to Vivacity for supporting the event today. So we look forward to welcoming you to further webinars by Land or Links. Look out for coverage of this and other transport news on transportextra.com. And it's bye-bye for me and all of the presenters for now. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.